We are in the last part of a series, if you've not been with us or if you have been, but just like you've been zoning out every sermon. We are in the last part of a series called The Way of Delight. Uh, for the last five weeks, six weeks counting tonight, we've uh, been looking at Psalm 119, the longest chapter in the longest book of the Bible dedicated solely to the beauty, mystery, power, and truth of God's Word. We have a theme verse for the series. Some of you may know the theme verse. I shared this a couple of weeks ago. Oh, you put it up there too soon. Don't give it away. It's a memory verse. I was in uh, Target a few weeks ago. I think I might have shared this. I can't remember if I told this Saturday night or not. And I was uh, shopping for whatever I was shopping for. And I heard a voice from the other aisle say, I delight in your decrees. I will not neglect your word. I thought, Lord, are you speaking to me? It was some guy from our church who saw me coming and hid on the other aisle and was calling out to me the memory verse. But at least he memorized it. So our, our verse is, anybody know it? I just said it. Can you say it with me? I delight in your decrees. I will not neglect your word. Now, I hope that's been your prayer. It doesn't have to end at the end of this series that we delight in the Word of God because it's true, it's trustworthy, it's authoritative. It gives us life. It reveals to us the path of His life. And there's nothing else like it. And we will not neglect it or forget it. And uh, what I want to talk about here as we wrap up the series is something a little bit different than this Psalm 119. We could spend, by the way, the rest of 2014 in Psalm 119 and not exhaust the beauty and the majesty of God's Word. But a few weeks ago, I was watching a cable news debate, which is always tricky. And it was, uh, there was a conservative and a liberal debating each other, pundit, expert, whatever. And they were debating this question, is America still the land of the free? And they went back and forth, and the debate pretty much went nowhere, as TV debates generally do. But it was the, uh, the, the question that caught my attention and started me thinking. Is America still the land of the free? And of course, the conservative was saying, no, and not anymore. Our government is infringing on our freedoms, and we're no longer the land of the free. And the liberal, of course, was saying, yes, we are. We're freer than ever before. You just have the wrong definition. And they were fighting back and forth about it. And as I said, it went nowhere. But I started thinking about that question. Freedom. What does it really mean? What exactly is freedom? How do we define it in our culture? Sociologist Mark Corey, who's an expert and a scholar in the Declaration of Independence in our U.S. Constitution, writes this. What is freedom and how is freedom related to liberty? Freedom cannot be defined except through an analysis of the restrictions upon human action. Liberty conveys the idea of the right or the ability of the individual to do what he wants. Freedom, on the other hand, is a word which contains inbuilt restrictions. A free society contains individuals who are free to do what they do whilst respecting the freedom of others. Freedom is the liberty of the individual coupled with the concern by the liberated individual for the liberties of others. I could read on, but it gets boring from there. His point is that we think of freedom in our culture in terms of uh, purely negative terms. When you, most people talk about freedom. Freedom from things, right? Freedom from government interference, freedom from restriction, freedom from bondage, freedom from slavery, freedom from oppression, poverty, injustice. We even talk about financial freedom, which means having enough wealth to do what I want, when I want, where I want, how I want, right? Free means the removal of restrictions to most people in our culture. However, the scholar here, I think, points us to, I'm not sure that he's a Christian, but he points us to a different idea that freedom carries with it some kind of restrictions. We'll come back to that idea in a few moments, because if freedom is really just the removal of restrictions on individual liberty, think about it. If that's what freedom is, just to take away all the restrictions, do whatever you want, when you want, how you want, with who you want, with no restrictions. That, if, if human history tells us anything, it tells us that that does not usually work out too well for human beings. We don't do well with no restrictions. My freedom to swing my arm ought to be restricted at least short of your nose. Otherwise, I'd be infringing on your freedom not to have your nose punched. I mean, we can't live in a society where there's no restrictions. That's not actually a free society. That's anarchy and chaos. Most people define freedom in negative terms, freedom from restriction, yet that's really not, even in our culture, what freedom means. So, so the debate always ends up being, well, what kind of restrictions, how much restrictions, who gets to impose the restrictions? The Bible has a completely different view of what freedom is. In fact, it's almost the exact opposite of the way our culture thinks about it. If you have your Bible open to Psalm 119, not surprisingly, verse 45. This will be our, we're going to jump all over in the, in the chapter here tonight, uh, but this verse will be sort of uh, the jumping off point. The psalmist writes, I shall walk about in a wide place, for I have sought your precepts. I shall walk in a wide place, 
for I have sought your precepts. The popular view by many people today is that freedom is that a God who wants to conform you to his will, his law, and his rules is the antithesis or the enemy of human freedom, your personal freedom. The psalmist in Psalm 119 could not disagree more. A wide place. Liberty, freedom. It's the Hebrew word rechabah. It literally refers to the open square in a city or town where free citizens were free to roam about unrestricted and make choices in the markets. That's the, that's the word, that's the word picture he's giving us. I will walk about in a wide open place, free to make choices. Why? Because I've sought out your precepts. I've sought out your law. That's a fascinating connection he makes there. The kind of freedom that comes from seeking out and obeying the precepts of God. Remember precepts, a few weeks ago we talked about this. The word precepts in Hebrew refers to orders given by a military officer to those under his charge. Precepts were spoken commands, given orders. So what the psalmist is saying is, I move about freely in wide open spaces when you tell me what to do. When you give me orders. That does not exactly fit with our cultural connect definition or understanding of what freedom is. If you want to be truly free, then follow the rules. If you want to be truly liberated, then get yourself under God's authority and take orders from his word. If you want to be free, obey. Those don't go together in our culture, do they? That's not how people talk about or think about freedom. You see, one of the real problems with our cultural definitions of freedom is it elevates the human individual to the highest level. Because if freedom means you get to do what you want, when you want, how you want, where you want, with who you want, then you're the ultimate moral and spiritual authority over your life. You get to determine what's good and what's right and what's true for you. And, quite frankly, you are not qualified to make those decisions. You are not qualified to be the highest moral and spiritual authority over your life. And I'm not qualified to be over my life or your life or anyone else's life. We need someone higher than ourselves. I'll read to you an excerpt from what I, what's been called the, Stephen Turner wrote this, the modern thinker's creed. I've always found it humorous and sadly accurate. He's writing about our culture today. We believe in Marx, Freud, and Darwin. We believe everything is okay as long as you don't hurt anyone to the best of your definition of hurt and to the best of your knowledge. We believe in sex before, during, and after marriage. We believe in the therapy of sin. We believe that adultery is fun. In fact, we believe all taboos are pretty much taboo. We believe that everything's getting better despite all the evidence to the contrary. The evidence must be investigated, and you can prove anything with evidence. We believe there's something in horoscopes, UFOs, and bent spoons. Jesus was a good man, just like Buddha, Muhammad, and ourselves. He was a good moral teacher, though we think his good morals were sometimes bad. We believe that all religions are basically the same. They all believe in love and goodness. They teach the same things. They only differ on matters of creation, sin, heaven, hell, God, ultimate reality, and salvation. We believe that after death comes nothing, because when you ask the dead what happens, they say nothing. If death is not the end, if the dead have lied, then it's compulsory heaven for all, except perhaps Hitler, Stalin, and Genghis Khan. We believe that man is essentially good. It's only his behavior that lets him down. This is the fault of society. Society is the fault of conditions, and conditions are the fault of society. We believe that each man must find the truth that is right for himself. We believe there's no absolute truth, excepting the truth that there's no absolute truth. Think about that one for a while. If chance be the father of all flesh, disaster is his rainbow. And when you hear state of emergency, sniper kills 10, troops on the rampage, bomb blast school, it is but the sound of man worshiping his own maker. We are not qualified to be the ultimate moral and spiritual authority over our lives, or anyone else's life for that matter. That's not what freedom is according to the Bible. If you are the ultimate moral and spiritual authority over your life, then my friend, you're in trouble. You're in real trouble. In fact, nobody is really their own moral and spiritual authority. Psalm 119, verse 37. The psalmist writes this, Turn my eyes from looking at worthless things and give me life in your ways. The phrase worthless things is a Hebrew word for idols. He's talking about idolatry. Turn my eyes away from false gods and give me life in your ways. The assumption is that if you're not obeying God, you're already obeying someone or something else. And it's not you. The Greek philosopher, long before Christ walked the earth, Euripides wrote, no one is truly free 
They are a slave to wealth, fortune, law, or other people restraining them from acting according to their will. No one is truly free. And he's right. If freedom means you get to decide what's, what you want to do, that's a myth and a lie. It doesn't even exist. You're already influenced, though you don't see it, by someone or something else. Look at verse 133 of Psalm 119. The psalmist says, Keep steady my steps according to your promise. Let no iniquity get dominion over me. Let no iniquity, no sin, no false god, no evil power, nothing else get dominion. Power, let it, nothing else reign over me, he's saying. Fifteen times in this psalm, the psalmist makes a very clear connection between living life, having life, gaining life, and the Word of God, commands, laws, precepts, and so forth. Let's just look through a few of them. We don't have time to go through all of them. Verse 17. Deal bountifully with your servant that I may live and keep your word. Verse 40. Behold, I long for your precepts. In your righteousness give me life. Verse 77, let your mercy come to me that I may live, for your law is my delight. Verse 107, I am severely afflicted. Give me life, O Lord, according to your word. And one more, verse 156, great is your mercy, O Lord. Give me life according to your rules. Fifteen times, just a few of them, the psalmist makes a connection between the life he wants to live, true life, liberating free life, and living according to God's rules, laws, commands, precepts. Most people tend to think of it in these terms. Okay, God is good and gracious and he offers me heaven through Jesus, and so I give up my personal freedoms in order to follow him, right? I surrender what I want. I give up my personal freedom in order to follow God. It's sort of a trade-off, but I win in the end because I get to heaven. That's how a lot of people I talk to think about becoming a Christian. Give up stuff, follow the spiritual religious rules, be a good person and, and not have much fun, and eventually you get into heaven. But, I, but you sacrifice your personal freedoms. But the psalmist has discovered the great secret. The secret that my life, your life, and your freedom, apart from God, are no freedom at all. They're slavery and tyranny. You hear that? Apart from Christ, your life and your personal freedom is no freedom at all. It's slavery in disguise. Fear, wealth, approval, they all force us to obey their will. And most of us just aren't aware of it. We get back to one, verse 45 again. I have sought out your precepts, he says. I'll walk about in a wide place in freedom, in liberty. Why? Because I have sought out your precepts. What, he's not talking about obligation under compulsion. I walk about in a wide place because I have to obey. I seek them out, he says. I go after them. I hunger for them. I long for them. I delight in them. He loves, he seeks, he delights in God's law. Timothy Keller wrote this in his book, Counterfeit Gods. It's a great line and a great book. He wrote, now that God is my master, nothing else may master me. I love that quote. If God is my master, nothing else can have master, nothing else, no iniquity, no sin, no other power, power no, no desire for approval, no control by fear and anxiety. Nothing else can master me because I already have a master. The master. Freedom then. Going back to the cultural definition of freedom, right? Freedom is lack of restrictions. Take off all those restrictions. I remember when I was a kid, um, I would go to my, the golf club my dad belonged to on occasion. And I didn't really care about golf, but I liked to drive the cart. And there was one cart, I knew the number, number 16, that didn't have the governor on it. You know what the governor is? It, was, it restricts the speed of the golf carts. One, one cart, it was broken or wasn't working or something, but I always wanted to drive cart 16 because it would haul all over the golf course. You know, I used to get in trouble for that. No restrictions, right? That's how I think of freedom. Take off all the restrictions. The Bible says, no, that doesn't even exist, friends. And it's dangerous for you. Freedom is not a lack of restrictions. Freedom is finding the right ones. Freedom is discovering the right restrictions because we all live under some of them. And the psalmist has found them in God's word. That's why he says 
He delights in them. He longs for them. He loves them. They're sweeter than honey. He can't get enough of them. He pants for them. This is love language. He's talking about he seeks them out. Why? Because he sees there's liberty in them. There's life in them. It's not an obligation. I have to do what God says. Otherwise, he'll be angry with me. He sees it's freedom. I've always envisioned hang gliding as like the ultimate free experience. I've never been hang gliding. I don't think I ever will go hang gliding. I'm not convinced it will hold me up, but nevertheless, I still think of it in my mind, you know, that like the closest thing to being a bird, right? Just floating free over some valley or ravine or over a river or something like that off a cliff. But hang gliding, as far as I understand it, still is bound by some pretty significant restrictions, isn't it? As far as I know, you cannot hang glide underwater, at least. You have to hang glide according to the laws of aerodynamics. There are certain things that, it, that, even, that even govern that feeling of freedom. Or, for example, a lion in a zoo. We would all agree that a lion in the Brookfield Zoo is less free than a lion on the African plain. Why? One, it's not because of the cage so much as one is, is free in the sense that it's able to live according to its created design or purpose, and one is not. That's, you want a good definition, a, a biblical definition of freedom? Freedom is living according to your created design and purpose. That's freedom. And we're, we live in a culture where people are trying to live on some other purpose, and that's slavery, that's oppression, that's self-imposed tyranny, that's bondage. Freedom is living according to your created design and purpose. The Bible says clearly, you and I were created and designed for a purpose. To know, to love, to serve, and to obey God. That's freedom. And it's our culture and our sinful nature that flips it around on us. I remember when my son, youngest son was in fifth grade, I went as a chaperone with him to the Brookfield Zoo. I've shared this story on numerous occasions, but it's fun to tell. Uh, and I had six fifth grade boys. I was responsible. That was like herding cats. I consider myself a, a decent leader, but I was stretched to the limit on that day, trying to keep them, you know, like in, in under control. And they wanted, we had to go see all the, uh, the animals, they had like a, a checklist from the teacher, you know, their science teacher or whatever. And they didn't want to see the birds. They wanted to see the snakes. They wanted to see the, the gorillas. And they wanted to see the lion. That's what they cared about. And the elephant. So we're at the lion's, you know, pen. And the boys want to hear the lion roar because they'd heard in class that a lion's roar on the African plain can be heard for up to five miles. So these little fifth grade boys are trying to get the lion to roar. They're all lined up on the rail, roaring, rawr, rawr, you know, the fifth grade roar at the lion. And the lion is laying there like, really? You think I'm, I'm just going to roar for you, little kids? I haven't seen this before. Just looking at him like, no way, you know. And it was amusing to me. But I couldn't get him to leave. They wanted that lion to roar. And I'm like, we've got to go eat lunch. Come on, let's get out of here. And so finally I thought, if you can't beat him, join him. So me, the dad, and <laughs> six fifth grade boys are roaring at this lion. And the lion is just looking at us like, oh. Rolling his eyes. So we finally got exhausted or so and walked away. We got two steps past the edge of the pen and the lion roared. I almost wet my pants. It was unbelievable. It shook my heart. The boys went, whoa. They looked at me, their eyes were like this big. They were terrified and excited all at the same time. And it was just a glimpse, just a little taste of what the lion was meant to be, right? Just a little hint of what the lion would be like living according to its creative design and purpose. Do you know what it's like? You ever have that feeling when you, when you know you're doing what God wants you to do? Even though it's hard at times, but you feel, I know this is what God wants for me. It's that feeling of just a taste. This is what it's like. This is what it's like to be free. It's not financial freedom. It's not political freedom. It's not the stuff our culture talks about. It's living according to our creative design and purpose, how God made us to live. And everything in our heart that's sinful and our culture that's out of whack tells us that we got it wrong, tells us this is oppressing you, it's keeping you down. It's not true. God made you to set you free and the only path to freedom. God's word is not an inhibitor to your freedom. It's not in the way of your freedom. It's the only path to it. Living according to your creative design and purpose. Living in disobedience to God's law, then, is essentially violating your own design and nature. See, it's not as if God sat down and said, well, look, I'm in charge, I'm God. And since I'm in charge and you're all not in charge, there have got to be some rules. So I'm going to come up with some rules. Let me think. Um, I know you have to forgive each other. That's one. That's a good one. Uh, even though you don't want to, even when people hurt you, I'm going to make you forgive. That's a rule. You have to follow it. And we go, okay, fine, you're in charge. No, that's not. God himself lives in relational community. I'm just choosing one command for an example, and there's a reason why I'll tell you in a minute. 
He, he lives the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in perfect harmony. He created us in his image to be in relationships. He knows that when we live with unforgiveness in our heart, we are the ones enslaved. So the command to forgive each other is for your freedom, for to be set free, to be liberated from that. When I was thinking about this sermon and these commands, you could, pick, you could write on down the list of all God's commands and you could explain why that is for our freedom not to, set, to bind us up, but to set us free. But this one came home to me because, honestly, about two weeks ago, there was somebody in my life that I was holding something against. It wasn't a huge deal. Nobody in this room. <laughs> but in my, I, just had, I just was annoyed with a person for something that they had done or said, both. And... I thought, they should know better. And it was as if God was saying to me, as far as it depends on you, Romans says, live at peace with all people, go to them. And I thought, I know how it's going to go. They're not going to listen. It never ends up well. Besides, I didn't do anything. They did. It's on them. I'm just going to move on. And, but you know what? I'm holding it against them. It's an issue of obedience. And I, in my heart, I don't want to do it. Right? I've got reasons. I don't want to do that. And I feel as if God's oppressing me with this command to forgive. But it's not so. He's trying to set me free. Because I'm bound up in there, you see. And the same thing with you. Whatever it is that you're resisting God in, that's for your freedom. That's for your liberty. That's for your good, your joy, your delight. It's not trying to hold you back or hold you down. You, you, you're doing that. And the sin in your heart is doing that. And in mine too. The Bible really makes some astonishing claims about obedience when you think about it. If obedience is the path to freedom, we're told that obedience brings joy, it brings peace, it brings fulfillment, it brings life. But if I'm honest, and I would guess you're like this too, when I look at the Ten Commandments, the centerpiece of God's law, and I think about my total inability to keep them, I don't always feel joyful, fulfilled, and peaceful, and liberated, do you? Yet the psalmist says that he longs for, delights in, is desperate for the law of God. This is love talk. He's not saying, I know that they're a good idea and I should try harder. He's, he's using almost scan. You ever read through, have you read through Psalm 119 in the series? I hope you have. It's almost, it's almost like over the top. Don't you, when you read it, it's scandalous. It's almost like, okay, we get it. You really like God's word. I mean, it's just, it's almost, it's, uh, it's love language he's talking about. C.S. Lewis, in his book, The Four Loves, says, we are never more restricted nor more liberated than when we are in love. That's a brilliant statement. Think about it. We are never more restricted or more liberated than when we are in love. Here's what he means. When you are in a love, I'm not just talking about romantic, you know, oh, I'm in love. I mean, when you are in a deep, committed love relationship with another person, a loving relationship, intimacy with another human being, you are, by definition, bound to them, right? You care about what they care about. You want to know what matters to them. You want to conform your will to at least some degree to their will. Therefore, you have restrictions over your life. You're not free to do stuff only for yourself, right? There are restrictions when you're in love. But do you ever feel that way? No. You feel totally liberated, right, when you're in love. When you love somebody, even though there are restrictions, you don't feel restricted. You feel set free because you're in love with the person. That's a hint of what the psalmist is trying to convey to us about freedom in the Word of God. When we come to God's Word, that we are bound. Freedom is not the, the elimination of restrictions. It's finding the right ones. And when you find your freedom in, within the parameters of God's Word, you're free indeed. John 14, verse 23, Jesus said, If anyone loves me, he will keep my commandments, and my Father will love him, and we will come and make our home with him. It's a beautiful picture. The more we conform ourselves to God's word, the more he reveals himself to us, the more we love him and grow in a desire to live according to his word. Jesus Christ, we're told in Philippians, humbled himself and became obedient to death even death on a cross. Why? So that we might be exalted, liberated, set free. Love for the Father and love for us. And Jesus then is not just our example, although he is, of a perfect sinless life. He is our obedience. 
He is our righteousness. He's our perfect record. So many people think the gospel works like this. I work hard to get a good record of my life and give it to God and he blesses me in return. That is, that is most people I talk to think, at least subconsciously, that's how it works and they're dead wrong. That's not in here. Here's how it works. God sees us in bondage and slavery to sin and to ourselves. And he gives us the perfect record we cannot get. How does he do that? At the cross, in Christ. Here's your record, take this. Then we, because we've been set free, want to please him, want to bless him in return. It's not we give God a record and he blesses us. It's God gives us the record of his son Jesus and we bless him in return by living according to his word and therefore set free. I want, I want to be a free person. Not just because I live in the United States of America but because I live under the authority and the power and the freedom of God's word. And that's what God wants for you too. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the power of your word. We confess to you that sometimes we ignore it. Sometimes we resist it. Sometimes we see it as the enemy of our personal freedom. Forgive us for that. Help us by your spirit to see that we will walk about in freedom when we seek out you and your word. We pray this in Jesus' name, the living word. Amen.